And today I'd like to start reading from the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter, beginning reading with verse 14. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, in verse 14, we find here some words recorded that uh, Jesus had said. And it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. This is something I do have a bit of experience with. I'm blessed to have parents that are intelligent and are able to prepare for the things that are going to happen. Uh, we tend to live in places that the power would go out sometimes for days on end. Most of the time it was only for a few hours or for a night, and we'd have it back the next day. But uh, since my parents were very uh, able to plan and prepare for things, they always had plenty of candles and they always had plenty of lanterns. So I can tell you exactly what it's like to fix your food by candlelight and to bathe by candlelight. In the shower, the candle doesn't work very well at all. But uh, thankful to that, I know what it's like to live by uh, candle and uh, lantern power. And that's one thing that people don't put a city on a hill, a uh, city on a hill to hide it. I mean, Jerusalem was a city that was put onto a hill. Jerusalem was not put onto a hill to hide it. Jerusalem was put onto a hill in order to protect it, because wherever you looked from out it. Everywhere else was down low. So people would have to climb up to the top of the hill before they could start trying to go over the walls. And when we put candles and wherever we put lanterns in our houses, we put them up high, so number one, so things can't go and knock them down and cause our house to light on fire. But we also do it so the light can spread throughout the entire house and we can have more light from it. Now, if we could take a candle or a uh, lantern and set it on the ground and take a bushel or a basket to place it over it, then we would have a little bit of light through it, only the light that it can appear through the cracks in whatever we put over it, which we tend to do a lot. We call them lampshades, and they tend to let more lights through than what a uh, basket would. But lights and candles and things of that nature, we put them uh, up high so we can see the light from them, so we can use that to help us, so we can see the things around us, which at this time... People did things during the day, so when the sun would come up early, they would do things earlier, and the only thing they would have after the sun went down was candlelight to be able to light their way, and to be able to see the things that they wanted to do. So at this time, people didn't do a lot of things during the night. So it says here in the 16th verse, Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So just as we have uh, cities on hills, and just as we have candles and lanterns on hills, we are supposed to place ourselves as in the uh, same manner. Place ourselves out in the open so everybody can see, can see, as it says in here, see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Good works back in the time when uh, the books were being put together for the Bible was uh, a key word that they often looked for because the uh, Catholic Church said so much, if you do something wrong, all you have to do is penance. All you have to do is these works and God will forgive you for it. We don't find that in the scriptures, but that's one thing when they were putting the books together for the New Testament, they were trying to protect us from so that we wouldn't see where it says... Uh, may see your good works and think we can do things that would cause God to forgive us. We can't do anything that would cause God to forgive us. All we can do is humbly ask to <coughs> your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for Him to forgive us. It doesn't matter if we can move buildings. It doesn't matter if we can crumple mountains. It doesn't matter what all we can do because it's all nothing without Him. All we can do is simply request through His Son and our Savior for it to go away. And if we live faithful, God will do that for us. We can do all the works that we want to, and it won't make a difference. We can also see the uh, same type of wording in James, which James was a book that was uh, highly controversial when they were trying to uh, figure out whether they should stick it into the Gospels, because James said a lot about works. And in James' seven, second chapter, James' second chapter, uh, begin reading verse 17. 
in James' second chapter, in verse 17, it says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, and thou dost well. But the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now we can see back and forth from this, from the gospel, whereas Jesus basically told us that we should follow the commandments and the things which he taught in his word, his perfect commandments which he simplified those down a great majority for us, that we have simply to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and love our neighbors ourselves. He simplified it so much from what was written in the Old Testament. But it's also what's in our heart cometh out of our mouth. What's in our heart that cometh out of our works. So we can see in this, although our heart can be straight and our faith can be pure, we should use that faith, we should use that strength, we should use that knowledge to help those around us. I mean, if we take a look at the life of Jesus, what did Jesus do? Jesus went through times when he was very hungry. He went through a time of uh, being hungered before he went to the temptations. And then he, went, he was tempted to turn from God and to turn towards Satan. And after that was over, did Jesus go and take care of himself? No. Angels came down and they helped Jesus. And they helped uh, take care of Jesus and help Jesus to heal from that time. Angels came down to help Jesus at that time. Jesus didn't have to worry about himself. God was taking care of them. Just like God will take care of all of us. So if our heart is pure and our faith is pure, it will put us into a position what we can do is Jesus did to help others. Jesus had an amazing ability to help others. I mean, we can see simply from people believing, all I have to do, I don't even have to touch him. All I have to do is touch his cloak. And what happened? When the person touched his cloak, he felt the energy had gone out from him, and he turned to look to see exactly what had happened. And what did he say? Not, I have healed people. Not anything around you has healed me. He said, thy faith has healed me. Your faith in believing that all you have to do is touch my cloak, that is what healed you. It wasn't touching the cloak. But it was your faith in God to be able to take care of you and be able to heal you. That is exactly why they were healed. We can also take a look at Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, and the uh, fourth chapter, and beginning in verse 28, it says, Ephesians, the fourth chapter in verse 28, it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he might give to him that need. So we find here where Paul is writing to the uh, church in Ephesus. And he says, let him that steal, that stole, steal no more. But let the people that do wrong in the sight of God do that wrong no more. Let them turn from their wrong ways. And rather, let them labor, working with their hands, which is a good thing, and give to them that need it. That's the same thing we saw in the life of Christ. It's the same thing we saw in the life of the disciples that became the apostles. They gave to go those that were in need. We can find where uh, Paul had told the people that when they gather together, they should gather funds together. That uh, when he comes through in his times of traveling, that he can collect those funds and he can take them back to the uh, people that are in Jerusalem to help the church in Jerusalem. Because the church in Jerusalem at this time apparently had quite a few things that they needed help from. They had some monetary needs that they uh, needed to help make the church better. So Paul would do this. Paul didn't say, collect the funds so I may uh, uh, 
get them and I can live off them and I can support myself on them, but gather the funds so I can take those to those that are in need, to those that need the money, that we can help them through this gathering of funds to help those around us. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. The 29th verse, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So he's telling us to turn away from our things of the evil world, and turn away from the evil world and hold only to that which is good and strong and belonging to God. He's telling us, let no corrupt communication, let no stealing, let nothing that is evil live in our lives. But we are to turn from stealing, we are to turn from corrupt communication, because corrupt communication can be very disastrous. I mean, if you've ever uh, seen a bunch of kids playing the game telephone, it makes it very clearly what happens. A bunch of kids sit around, one kid tells one thing, one kid something, and it goes all the way around the circle, and then the one that originally said the thing hears from the other uh, kid on the other side what it was. How often is that the same thing? The more kids you have, the more it changes, and the more uh, you're surprised at the end exactly how it changed. Because every little bit, it changes from each kid going around the circle. All the little, little bits add up to a big bit, and you get a really big change after that. I mean, it's like all the people that follow Gospels that are written in the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1500s and the 1300s. How much does a person in the 1800s know about Jesus that they didn't know in the first century? I'm persuaded to believe not very much. Because Jesus had already been crucified and dead and risen so many hundreds of years before that. I mean, that's one reason why we can take this gospel, we can take these gospels written by these people, written by the apostles, and hold to it knowing that it's as correct as we can find anything, mainly because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were highly damaged, but they were damaged uh, through the age because they were hidden in sandstone caves from... Uh, around 1 to 300 uh, after Christ was uh, living on this earth. They were held by very devout people that believed in following the words of Jesus. And they followed on that, and in order to follow it, they felt it would be better if they took themselves away from the world, if they took themselves away from everybody else. So they took these things and they hid them in these uh, sand caves, and they lived in these uh, sandstone caves. So they could live together and they could help support each other to live good lives in the sight of God. I mean, we can even find that in the uh, lives of the apostles. Uh, we can find where they gathered together and they shared all their possessions. All their possessions they shared among everybody so everybody would have plenty and nobody would have too much. I mean, it's even as Paul said at times... He would lay down, but he wouldn't have but a stone to lay his head down on. Because he didn't carry the bedding and the things that we take for granted every day around with him. That wasn't what was important to him. What was important to him was going to the areas, was talking to the people, and helping lead the people to live good and right lives in the sight of God. Next, take a look in James, the fourth chapter. In the book of James... In the fourth chapter, beginning in the thirteenth verse, where it says, Go now, ye say, today or tomorrow, we will, have, we will go to such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. You know, that had to been a very similar situation back then, because I know it's a very similar situation now. I mean, we do nothing right now because we say, tomorrow we will go into this place and we will get these things and we will do these things and we will get enough to help us for an extended period of time. But he says here in the 14th verse, Whereas ye know not what shall be the morrow. For what is your life, even as a vapor, that appeareth for a little time 
and then vanish the way. We've all seen a vapor. You take a uh, uh, kettle and you stick it on the stove and you turn the fire on, and when the kettle gets hot, you start seeing vapor come out. But you know what? I've never seen vapor to go from the kettle to the hood. It always disappears before that. It only lasts for so many inches above the hole. And then what happens? The water vapor, which is so hot, uh, gets in the 70 degree air, and it cools off and it disappears. Because it's no longer different from the temperature of the room air. It's the same temperature of the room air. So it only lasts a few inches being different. And then it becomes the same as all the rest of the air around it. So he says in the uh, 15th verse, For this ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, as such rejoicing is evil. I mean, those of us who live in areas where it doesn't rain a whole lot, get very comfortable with, if the Lord will allow this to happen, it will happen. If the Lord won't allow it to happen, it won't happen. Does anyone who's lived on the other side of a creek or knows somebody who's lived on the other side of a creek, when you get a lot of rain coming in a short period of time and you hadn't had any, you're not going to cross that creek. It's got too much water in it. Unless you have a really big truck, you're not going to make it through that creek. So there are a lot of people, when the rains come, there are a lot of rains, they're stuck at home for a while. They're stuck on that side of the creek. Because they're not able to come through the water to get to the other side. And it's always happening like that. That's the most dramatic uh, ones we can find right now. It's like in Hawaii. In Hawaii, they've got volcanoes going all the time. The entire island's made from volcanoes. And they have lava runs all the time. You know what happens if you try and drive your car over a lava run? The tires burn up and go flat very fast. Because that fire is hotter than what they used to make the tires to begin with. So they know in islands where you have a lot of volcanic activity that when lava is flowing through there, then we're not going. It's like people who live in southern Louisiana. They get a lot of animals going across the road, especially when you get the ones that are like 12 and 15 foot across. What do you do when you have a gator sitting on top of the road that's 15 foot across? You're not going to move it. I can guarantee you that. That thing weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Uh, you could attach your truck to it, and you might have a chance to be able to move it, but those animals have lots and lots of muscle in their legs and lots and lots of muscle. They're not moving unless they want to. So if they're across the road, then you're either turning around and finding another way, or you're going off-roading, one of the two. And it makes that plain and simple, and it's going to be that way till the end of time. And then what happens at the end of time? Jesus said, only the Father knows the time when this earth will go away. But there is a time and there is a manner for it, and this earth will go away in the flash of an eye. So is that going to be today? Well, so far it's not. Is it going to be tomorrow? It's a possibility. But when that day comes, whatever we put towards the future is not going to happen because the future of uh, this earth is not going to be there. It says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So we're going to have new things to deal with. So why worry about that stuff for doing it tomorrow? The important stuff we'll do today. I mean, it's like, let's take a look in Matthew. In the book of Matthew, in the 6th chapter, begin reading the 27th verse, where it says, in Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 27th verse, Which of you, by talking, uh, taking thought, can add one cubit unto your... His stature. So who can, by thinking something, add one cubit or can add anything to their stature? So the 28th verse. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toll not, neither do they spin. Which is some things we have to do. We have to, uh, somebody has to toil with the uh, ground to be able to grow the cotton, and somebody's got to go through and pick the cotton, got to separate the seeds out, and got to pull it, and then got to spin it into thread, all so, so that uh, somebody can weave it into clothes, and we can have clothes to wear. The lilies of the field don't do it. 
They don't worry about any of that stuff. They don't worry about growing anything. They don't worry about toiling. They don't worry about spitting. And the 29th verse, And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Even Solomon, who was the wisest man in the Old Testament, has, was the king, had everything he wanted. He was not arrayed as one of the lilies of the field. How great the lilies of the field are. How beautiful the lilies of the field are. And they don't worry about a thing because God takes care of them. God causes the rain to come. God causes the bees to come and spread the pollen and all that stuff. They don't have to worry about any of that. Other things worry about them. They get taken care of because God does it. Just like he does for each one of us. As it says in the 33rd, as the 31st, 30th verse, Wherefore, if God shall clothe the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow cast into the oven, shall not he much clothe you? O ye of little faith. The lilies of the field, the flowers of the field, the grass of the field, God takes care of all of them. And they're around today, but if a little kid comes through, the flowers aren't going to be around for very long because the little kid's going to pick them up. So it doesn't matter whether they're toiling for it, whether they're doing anything to take care of themselves, but they let it go because God will take care of them. He'll take care of them today, and tomorrow a little kid will come through and pick all of them, and they'll all be dead. But God takes care of them the same, just like he takes care of each one of us. And the 32nd verse, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth what you have need of. All these things. All these things the Gentiles seek. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are the ones that are not Jews. The Gentiles, the Gentiles are the ones that... They were the ones that were second given the gospel. Because God said to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. And God had the apostles go to teach the Jews. And then he selected Paul and blinded him on the way to Damascus. Where Paul was in the middle of this road to Damascus and had to follow along, blinded, going to Damascus to go and see Ananias, which he had been told of in a dream. And only after Paul went to see Ananias was his vision given back to him. And what effect did that have on Paul? Three quarters of the New Testament was written by Paul. We have all the letters that he was writing to all the churches that he went to visit. And we have the uh, last half of Acts, the 12th through the end of the book, telling us what all Paul did to help grow the church and help the church increase. And yet he didn't care for preparing for the things that he had to do more than having a pillow to put his head on. It wasn't what was important to him. What was important to him was the works that he could do that day. Because he probably thought there was going to be a next day, but he had to get the stuff done today, because tomorrow is not promised to us. So we have all these things that we need to think about. We have to have our light let shine before men so they glorify our Father which is in heaven. And we have to know that we have to take this belief, this faith that we have to do right and to do works, helping those others that are around us. And we don't need to uh, corrupt that with corrupt communication. We don't need to corrupt that with things of gossip, with things that don't really matter. We need to focus on things that matter. And the only thing that matters is living a good and faithful life in the sight of God. And we need to remember that we don't need to take care of the things of this life for us. I mean, we're in the uh, scriptures we find where the apostles built themselves big houses and had themselves wagons and they had themselves all of these things to help take care of themselves so that they could do the other things. They didn't. They trusted God would support them enough to lead them to places where they could have the food to eat, lead them to places where they could have water to drink, and lead them to places where they could have good, honest hearts to turn towards the gospel. 
And sometimes the easiest way to remember these things is the simplest sayings and the simplest things. So who do we give the simplest things and the simplest sayings to? We give them to our children. Because our children haven't developed enough to learn uh, advanced geometry and to learn biophysics and to learn all these things. They haven't learned that stuff yet. So you can give them all that stuff you want to, and they're not going to learn a bit of it other than, that's nice shapes. But we give them the simple things so they can grow and learn and understand the things that are around them. One of the songs we give them is, Grow, Grow, Grow Your Boat. It's a very simple song. Grow, Grow, Grow Your Boat. It's telling us that we need to row our boats. We need to row our lives. We need to row our lives down the stream of life because we don't know when that waterfall is coming in. And what does it say after that? Gently down the stream. We don't need to fight. We don't need to argue with people. We don't need to cause things that cause strife in our lives. But we need to row our boat gently down the stream. Wasn't that how Christ lived his life? I mean, Christ was born, Christ went and did the things. Things weren't easy for him to do in some of them. But he went around teaching the people and helping the people everywhere he went. I mean, the biggest time that we can find when Christ got violent and Christ got uh, to where he was causing damage was when he went to the temple and he found there were so many people that were selling things for others to sacrifice. They were making money on the sacrifices that they were giving to God. And he tried to take them. But we are to row, row, row our boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 by his blood. What's that drink we're looking for? I tell you, this time, this, this life has gotten sometimes when it can seem like a dream. There are people that have um, great amounts of money and great amounts of power, and they might feel their life is like a dream because it's almost like it can't be true. But if we row our boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 we have heaven in the end. Heaven is our dream. And it's a very simple song. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, It's a great key to remind us how we should live and what we should do. I mean, we teach the simplest things to our children, but the simplest things are the ones that catch the most in our mind and can lead the most to remind us of the more complex things in our lives. But we have to take the simple things and take it day by day, doing the things that we need to do in one day because the next day is not promised to us. In Christ, we have the ability to have forgiveness. Through his sacrifice and through his words, we've simply been told all we have to do is admit, all we have to do is confess that what we're doing is not right. And confess that we believe that we need to do something else. We need to do something to right in our ways. And follow the example that he gave. What example did he have? I mean, he was born, and the next thing we know, he was being baptized. And then he's being tempted. And then he was teaching the gospel until the time that he died. It's a perfect example that he gave us. 